This is Kennedy Classics with Dr. D. James Kennedy. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. I'm Jerry Newcomb. And I'm Jennifer Kennedy Cassidy. All around us, there are false gods. In biblical times, they were often carved out of wood or made out of gold. Today, they tend to be dangerous political movements and philosophies. As the reformer John Calvin said, the human heart is an idol factory. We'll either worship the true God or a false one, but we'll all worship something. On today's program, we'll expose some of the false gods of the modern age. Where might you or your children be led astray? Later in the program, we'll have an important report on how one dangerous philosophy could impact your health care. And we'll share an excellent new resource with you that will help you understand the biblical foundations our nation was founded upon and is departing from. And I'm John Sorensen. What's the most important thing the true God wants you to know to follow Him? I'll tell you more about it later in the program. But first, my father, the late Dr. D. James Kennedy, exposes some of the false gods of our own day by looking at the false gods the prophet Elijah confronted in his important message, If the Lord be God. Examine all of history, sacred, and profane, and you will never find a contest comparable to the one before us today. Nothing in the Olympics, Super Bowl, the World Series, the heavyweight championship, even the triple crown begins to compare with this. This is not a matter of trophies or wreaths, but it is a matter of life and death for all of those that were involved, and not only for them, but also for the religion of Israel, which was being wiped out from within by the invasion of an alien philosophy and religion, Baalism, the worship of the god, the Phoenician god Baal, or Baal in Hebrew. And this had found its great support through the queen of the wife of Ahab, who was Phoenician herself, brought into Israel. She brought her religion and 450 priests of Baal with her. And now the religion of Jehovah was being overwhelmed by these false teachings. And the prophets of the true faith had been persecuted and killed by the queen, and uh, there were few that were left. And so God determined to bring the people to repentance. This was an inward struggle, a spiritual struggle, a struggle of the heart and soul, a struggle of the mind, lest the very true religion should be aborted and the Messiah not be born. This is the great effort, another great effort of Satan done to prevent the Messiah from ever coming and fulfilling that great promise made in the Garden of Eden that the child, the seed of the woman, will destroy the head of the seed of the serpent. Very much like what we face today, I believe. Now, we don't have a pagan religion as such overwhelming our nation, but we have all manners of unbelief. Foreign religions of various kinds have taken up residence in this country. But more than that, we have secularism, atheism, agnosticism. We have humanism and evolutionism and all manners of unbelief, all of which agree in denying Christ and the scriptures and the Christian religion. And this is very similar to what uh, Israel was facing at that time, a, a religion alien to what they had known. 
Now, Baalism was not the religion simply of the Phoenicians, but it was widespread in the ancient world. It was a great religion. It was the religion of Baal or Baal, who, the Lord, a religion that was not only in Phoenicia, but also in Babylon, known there as Bel or Bel Merodach. It was known in Greece under the name of Zeus. It was known all the way over to Carthage that challenged the Roman Empire. Baalism was widely spread throughout the whole Mediterranean area, and it was a powerful faith, and it was a great threat to the spiritual life of Israel. If this one man who had the faith and courage to stand up to it had not done so, I can tell you this, you wouldn't be here today and I wouldn't be here preaching either because there would have been no believers to bring forth a Messiah. But we have all kinds of radical unbelievers today including the radical unbelieving ecologists who, that's a fine thing unless it's taken too far. One of the professors in a prestigious university said this, see if you think this is radical. <laughs> he said, it, the best thing that could happen to this world would be the utter extinction of the human race. Well, that's not radical, is it? We're supposed to be radicals, according to them. And he says, though that would be painful, just think how many millions of species could live and thrive if we, humans who are the plague of the earth, were removed. Now, I, I tell you, I, I'd love to meet that fella. He wants the whole world to commit suicide. I think I would tell him, sir, you are a bold and fearless leader. I am sure that the world is waiting to follow your lead. So now, if you will just kill yourself, the world will no doubt follow in your train. If not, then shut up, you hypocrite. Well, that's very similar to the religion of Baal, which is a religion of death, which did involve the sacrifice of humans back then. But of course today we're supposed to tolerate all things like that. And uh, however, Elijah did not believe that. And the Lord told him to go to Ahab the king. Now Ahab had some good qualities about him, but he was also a weak and vacillating man and he unfortunately married a, a pagan invited her into the court and adopted her religion, built a temple to Baal right there in the capital of Samaria, which was of, of the Northern Kingdom, which was uh, the city of Samaria, and had other capitals throughout that land. And so Ahab is confronted by the prophet Elijah, who appears and says unto him, by the Lord God of Israel, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And he spins on his heel and strides away, no doubt leaving Ahab speechless. But then the days pass and the weeks and the months and already whatever clouds were in the sky have disappeared and now the sky is a copper sky of brass that seems to have lost the understanding of rain. No cloud is seen week after week and month after month. The white bones of the cattle and sheep glistened in the relentless sun. It was a time of death. It was a time for people to consider their God. So Ahab is told where Elijah is, and he goes out to confront him, trying to sum up all of the royal dignity he has left. And he says haughtily, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And Elijah said, 
I am not he that troubleth Israel, but thou and thy father's house, for thou hast abandoned the commandments of God. And so Elijah sets before them a trial to see who is the true God. He says to the people of Israel, if the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal be God, then follow him. He did not say they couldn't follow Baal, but they couldn't do both. And that was the problem. Some of them were worshiping Jehovah and some of them were worshiping Baal and some of them were worshiping both. Well, my friends, there are many like that today, halting between two opinions. Oh, they don't worship outwardly some pagan God, but they have one foot in the church and another foot in the world. They don't want to miss out on the goodies of this life. I mean, maybe there's not a God, and I don't want to lose out on this life too, and so I'll get all the gusto I can get, and I'll still go to church and worship God, and then I'll be all right in either case, however it works out. I wonder if there are any here halting between two opinions. Now, what the people that Elijah was talking to were not pagans. He was talking to the children of Israel. And not was he talking, nor am I talking, to those who are sold out for Christ, those who are living for him, those who are serving him with their lives, worshiping him in truth, living for him during the week, following the Lord Jesus Christ as good soldiers of his. No, it's that great mass in between, that halt between two opinions. They've got just enough religion to make themselves miserable, but not enough to experience the joy. And so they come to church on Sunday and they go out and they hardly give it a thought for the rest of the week. And they live for self, the kingdom of their own desires, their own wishes, and their own kingdom that they're building. So I would ask you, my friend, you're probably not a pagan, you may be a devout follower of Christ. I hope you are. But I have no doubt that there are some here who are halting between two opinions. You have not either rejected Christianity wholeheartedly and become an atheist, maybe because of custom, tradition, Maybe fear that it might be true. Nor have you surrendered your life completely to him. May we pray. Father, get us off the fence. Help us to take a stand for thee or against thee, for your kingdom or the kingdom of this world, Lord, we pray that you'll bring us to make the right decision. For we know that those who are undecided and lukewarm will be spewed out of thy mouth at thy coming. We pray that some will say even right now, Lord Jesus Christ, I have been vacillating in my loyalty I have tried to live on both sides of the fence at once, but now I wholly commit myself unto thee. I know that the fire of your wrath has fallen again upon the Lord Jesus Christ on another hill scattered with blood, and that he paid the penalty for my sins 
that I might be forgiven and have eternal life. Come, Lord Jesus Christ, take over my life fully. I surrender myself to thee. In thy name, amen. I think a modern translation of Elijah's words would be, how long are you going to live with one foot in the world and one foot in the church? Perhaps it's a question you need to settle today. Maybe you're going to church every week, but you find yourself just going through the motions and now realize it's time to make a decision to truly follow the Lord. There's no better time to settle it than right now. And we can do it together in prayer. I can lead us and you can tell God what's on your heart by simply praying, Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for revealing yourself to me in this message today. Please forgive my sins and show me how I can live in a way pleasing to you, following you and only you from this day forward. Thank you for loving me enough to die for my sins so that I might have fellowship with you for all eternity. In your name I pray, amen. I hope you prayed that prayer, and if you did, we would like to help you get started in your new life by sending you Beginning Again, a book written by Dr. Kennedy to help enrich you spiritually. You'll learn how to pray, how to read and study God's Word, even how to witness to others. To receive Beginning Again, just write to our address or call our toll-free number. You can also log on to truthinaction.org. God bless you as you do. As my father shared in his message today, there is no middle ground between the true God of the Bible and the false gods of our own making. It's extremely dangerous to dabble in the modern religion of the isms, whether it be secularism, atheism, evolutionism, or materialism. One of the most dangerous isms is statism. The notion that the government ought to regulate every area of life and provide for every need. Yet today in America, state control is increasing wildly. This year, the government takeover of health care is set to take full effect, though the legal challenges continue. As you're about to see, in a nation where the government largely refuses to acknowledge the true God anymore, the intrinsic value of human life is diminished. If the official philosophy is that we all evolved accidentally by a blind process, the image of God is no longer recognized in humans. Combine government control with limited health care resources, and there's reason for intense concern. Let's take a closer look. There are people in this society, materialists, utter materialists, who think that all we are is so much meat on the hoof. If all we are is just another animal in the forest, that's how we'll treat each other. When we say a human being who is very ill should receive less treatment or should be cut off from care, as sometimes is now asserted to control medical costs, aren't we treating that person like a wounded animal in the forest? In 2010, against popular opposition, Congress passed and the President signed the so-called Affordable Care Act, making government health care a reality. The health care law is being gradually implemented through 2014. If you have government uh, centrally deciding what gets paid for, and in fact eventually who receives the benefit and who might not receive the benefit, and you have a situation of monetary difficulty as we do today, rationing is the natural outcome. Wesley J. Smith is the author of Culture of Death and writes extensively on bioethics issues. I'm afraid that we are in the midst of a shift in healthcare ethics, medical ethics, away from a sanctity of life, Hippocratic value system into a much more utilitarian system and even a consumer oriented system. We are beginning to see an assertion that doctors owe just as much a duty to the state or to the system, if you will, that they do to the individual patients. The Bible teaches that all human beings are created in the image of God. As a result, human life is inherently valuable. But what can happen when that view is jettisoned in favor of pragmatic concerns in the medical community? Hitler had many people prepare the way for him. 
That's not to say that all Germans bought into these ideas. Many Germans didn't believe in eugenics. Many Germans didn't believe in compulsory sterilization. But there were many in the intellectual elites, especially, who did and who were promoting those ideas long before Hitler came onto the scene. Historian Richard Weichardt is the author of the groundbreaking book, From Darwin to Hitler. He notes that a shift among doctors toward the Darwinian concept of survival of the fittest helped pave the way for Hitler's atrocities. Many of the very earliest proponents of euthanasia, abortion and infanticide, especially for the mentally ill and congenitally disabled, uh, were forthrightly using Darwinist ideas and arguments to support their vision of life and death. Uh, and uh, very clearly, Hitler drew on these ideas. Now, this, of course, preceded Hitler. Uh, there was a book that uh, came out in 1920 called Permission to Destroy Life Unworthy of Life. It deposited three killable categories. Those who were terminally ill, those who were unconscious, and if they woke up, would be appalled at their condition, and the so-called idiots, which was the terminology at the time, people with disabilities. As a consequence of this, in Germany, during World War II, doctors, and they weren't forced to by the Nazis, they did this voluntarily, doctors murdered hundreds of thousands of people with disabilities, starting with infants born with disabilities and eventually ending up with adults and so forth. It was kind of the practice for the Holocaust. Once the killing began, it was easy to broaden the categories of those deemed unfit. Under the Third Reich, instead of taking the Hippocratic Oath, doctors took a vow of loyalty to the state. They owed an obligation to the state, and they owed an obligation to the patient. Well, once you start having a mixed mandate, eventually, uh, I think in the Bible it says, you will either serve uh, mammon or you will serve God. Well, in this context, do you serve the state or do you serve the patient? And eventually the state prevailed over weak and vulnerable patients who were deemed a drain on the state. You know, I always cringe when people say, well, Hitler did this or Hitler did that or that's Hitler. We're not Hitler. Uh, the current uh, United States uh, health care law is not Hitler. Uh, but there are other ways to fall off a moral cliff than being Hitler. We can, with the best of intentions, end up in a situation where we treat some people less equally than other people. And the minute you begin to do that, you begin to open the door for oppression and exploitation. Unless you realize that human beings have a special and ultimate value based merely on being human, not earning it through having a capacity, then those who are deemed weak and vulnerable uh, are very, very much threatened. Such scenarios are not merely possible, they're already happening under health care rationing in America. There were two cases in 2008, and this is really insidious. Barbara Wagner and Randy Stroop. Barbara Wagner had a recurrent lung cancer, Randy Stroop recurrent prostate cancer, both were terminal. But their doctors prescribed for them chemotherapy to extend their lives. The Oregon State Medicaid system said, no, we are not going to pay to extend your life, but be of good cheer. We will pay for your assisted suicide. Under the new national health care law, an independent payment advisory board is being established to control Medicare costs, which will especially affect seniors. Critics have called the board a death panel. I'm very concerned about uh, the impact of our current trajectory on health care for the elderly. If you have a utilitarian mindset, if you have a quality of life mindset, and you look at somebody who, for example, uh, may have to uh, require a lot of care and, and is debilitated, and they say, well, they're not giving back to society. Well, first, that shouldn't be the criteria in health care. And second, what about a lifetime? of giving to society. We're talking about the greatest generation. This is the generation that overcame the depression. This is the generation that won World War II. They should certainly not be caused to suffer and be looked upon as somehow the bad guys uh, in healthcare because they're more expensive for whom to care. As you've just seen, when the sanctity of human life is undermined, there can be drastic consequences.
When the leaders of a nation sever themselves from biblical truth, even if they occasionally pay it lip service from time to time, there's nothing left to protect the weak from the powerful. Rather than being based on the inherent value of all human life, decisions about who lives and who dies, who gets help and who doesn't, are made according to economic or pragmatic concerns. If you're not seen by bureaucrats as being worth it, you lose. That's why it's so important to reclaim the biblical view of the world upon which this nation was founded and built. The fact is those who wrote the Declaration of Independence and our Constitution wouldn't recognize the America of today. They argued forcefully that our value and our rights come from God, the Creator. And because of that fact, those rights couldn't be taken away by the government. Now it's scandalous for a politician to merely pray publicly in Jesus' name in our day. If we're going to reclaim our freedoms, it's absolutely essential that we elect people to public office who have a view of government and human beings drawn from the Word of God. That's why we've put together an exciting new DVD bundle called The Bible and the Presidents. This four DVD set contains classic messages from Dr. Kennedy on some of the most important presidents America has ever had, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln. And we want to send it to you today when you give a generous gift to the ongoing work of this ministry. Simply write to us at Box 6053, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll-free 877-942-7677, or go online to truthinaction.org. Revisionist historians have tried to turn these presidents into unbelieving secularists. In reality, all of these great presidents believe that Christianity and the Bible were necessary to the survival of America. It's important that you have these messages for your children and grandchildren as well. And if you contact us right away, we'll also include the booklet, What They Believed, which includes written versions of these messages. We'll send you the four DVD set, The Bible and the Presidents, as well as the booklet, What They Believed, when you give a generous gift to the ongoing work of this ministry. Simply write to us at Box 6053, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll-free 877-942-7677, or go online to truthinaction.org. Maybe you can give a gift of $30, maybe you can give $50, $100, or more. Every gift is valuable as we seek to broadcast biblical truth on important issues like this through any means possible. Please contact us today. May God bless you as you do. And may God bless America. A video of today's program is available on DVD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. So please call, write, or log on to our website today. This has been a production of Truth in Action Ministries.